Go for it. If I had control of the uh, house lights, I would flash them at this point and start the open mic. Uh, so, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm sure you can hear me without. Much better. Kind of. Can you hear me? We well, can hear me without a microphone anyway. But is the microphone working? Yes, indeed. Oh, good. Okay. Well, welcome to the uh, open mic. I have. Oh goodness me! I have 11, 12, 13 if you include me. Oh, it's, so we uh, like to have about. Five, four or five minutes each. Some of you will read much shorter. Um, we're time, time isn't after us, so we'd like to kind of keep it jumping along here. Um, my name is Joshua Mertz, and welcome to this wonderful, fabulous afternoon of all you guys reading poetry. Thank you so much, you wonderful poets. So we'd like to ask, ask participants, uh, be considerate of other readers, don't ramble on way too long. We don't have a hook or anything, but I know you guys want to come up and read a fabulous poem, and, and away you go. Um, when I read, I find that people like humorous poetry more than they do serious poetry, with exceptions, of course, those that move the heart. So I wrote one about a grape I dropped on the floor one time, <laughs> called The Fruits of Escape. Somewhere under the refrigerator, there is a grape. It escaped yesterday from my grasp, struggling with little grapey arms and legs to free itself from my fingers and fly to its rendezvous with the floor, spinning in midair like a green, juicy athlete obsessed with the gymnastics of escape. The floor comes up hard, the grape rolls under the protective mantle of the mute refrigerator. Far above, munching on the escapee's unfortunate kin, I heard a small wet thunk and the sound of a little rolling body, and then no more. On hands and knees I search beneath the white enameled fortress of food for some glimmer of green, some wet trail of the traumatized fruit's escape. Nothing. The fleeing orb of sweet juice has fled with far within, retreated, hermit-like, into the realm of darkness and dust. The mute white box that once held the great prisoner now provides asylum in its mysterious undercavern. Someday, in the far-flung future, the cavern will be cleared and cleaned by tool or appliance replacement or geological catastrophe. And the ancient grape now a wise old raisin, will be released to the light and reveal to us all the truth of darkness and dust. So, I would like to welcome to the microphone Mr. Wayne Westfall. Please come forward. That's good. Isn't it interesting how you can write a story about just anything? <laughs> Inspiration comes from anywhere. It's, it's, it's fascinating how that works. What I read is a lot different from anything you've heard today so far, so hang with me as best you can anyway. This is, uh, I dream of the old days. With ticket in hand, I find the way leading me to gate C3. Gathering friends who came today, I motioned them to follow me, then hurry on since I don't know how far it is we need to go. Pausing for a coffee at the lone cafe, I kindly declined their eggs and ham, preferring to lunch on the plain today. Potatoes, carrots, and leg of lamb. So I'm good to go with my cup of joe and the trusty suitcase. I carry the stove. Advancing down the corridor, we marvel at photos of my flying craft. Lockheed Electra with turboprops four and beautiful lines from fore to aft. But I tarry not with my cup of joe and the heavy suitcase I carry the stove. Not soon enough we reach the gate and look for seats, alas in vain. But having still some time to wait, we scan the tarmac for my plane, and drinking in the scene below, I slowly sip 
my cup of junk. Excuse me, sir, your plane is here, so please get up and follow me. The uniformed lady's message is clear, but my mind's a whirl like a stormy sea. Gone is the warm and peaceful glow I, I knew till awakened a moment ago. There is no coffee cup nearby. And as I walk to the airplane door, I laugh out loud as I understand why. Then boarding the jet with engines four, my fading dream, I try to stow, yet can't quite seem to let it go. In days of old, we boarded planes, ham or steak, our lone concern. But then one day the world was changed and travel took an ugly turn. Yet still we fly, and still a glow remains of flights of long ago. Today, as I fly, it comes to mind that airport scanners safeguard me. But had I power to time rewind, time rewind just give me the old days, I would plea. Yet, while a dream can't make it so, I'll be just fine with a peaceful glow. I hope picked up the fact that the whole thing was just a dream. Yeah. Yeah. So when I read this the first time to people, they didn't catch it, so I had to change it. <laughs> Do I have time for another one? Sure. Uh, this, this next story is titled, I Need One Too. <coughs> Visiting a friend one day, I'm struck by sadness in her eyes. And as I search for words to say, she fakes a smile and softly sighs. With salty streaks down wrinkled cheeks, her agony she cannot hide. And haltingly, she slowly, slowly speaks emotions buried deep inside. I heard from Jane, she says through tears, who told me what her doctor said. From all the tests, he says he fears the cancer now has surely spread. As close as siblings, siblings in our youth, we later dreamed of wealth untold, but never recognized the truth that pain may rule when we're old. So hearing what the doctor said, I fear the worst and often cry, imagining I'm at her bed, struggling with the word goodbye. The vision haunts me night and day and often brings me to my knees where I look up to God and pray for healing of this great disease. Your eyes reveal you truly can, and since relief I cannot find, I hope you have some words to share to mollify my troubled mind. She looks at me expectantly, but silence trumps some old cliché. So wisdom still eluding me, mute I stand with not to say. When I was young, I married a girl who loved on me most all the time. But then one day, this precious pearl was snatched away before her prime. We all accept the wise man's verse, a time for birth and a time to die. Yet, like my friend, I curse the curse and grapple with the question, why? So knowing well the pain I see and Heartstrings given a tender tug, I act upon what's stirring me and offer comfort with a hug. Then memories, refreshed and raw, I add one more as tears accrue. Not to hear, not to heed some friendship law, but honestly, I need one too. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, the world of dreams and coffee. Um, next, we have a gentleman by the name of Steve Sanders. Ah, yes, indeed, who will come and read for us. Sander, no S. <laughs> is, that a, is that an S at the end? Oh, it's E. Next, we have Steve Sander. There's only one of him. 
instead of reading some poetry that I brought, because it's political and I would just get everybody in a bad mood, including myself, um, I'm going to do a, a tune that I've written. Um, it's, gonna, well, it's, it's mortality blues. It doesn't sound like that's an upper test necessarily, but it's the idea that you know we're clinging to life here and we certainly want to be around much longer than the times we're living through right now to see come out the other side. So, mortality blues. Um, I have one phrase in there that used to tell me, shit and piss, say it, slow, say it, say it softly. Anyway, we'll see how, I'll see how I deal with it when I get to it. <laughs> Don't take me down the river. Don't take me down the river. Don't take me down the river tonight. I got a lot of living, a lot of things to do. I got a lot of living for my days are through. Oh, I got a lot of living and people to see. I got a lot of living for my soul set free. Don't take me down the river. Don't take me down the river. Don't take me down the river tonight. I got a lot of loving, dreaming of you. I got a lot of loving, hope my dreams come true. Oh, I got a lot of loving, the touch of your lips. I got a lot of loving, the feel of your hips. Don't take me down the river, don't take me down the river, don't take me down the river tonight. I know the day is coming, I know the day draws near, I'll be riding down the river one time some year. And when that day is happening, when that day is here, I wonder how the river will flow. Will I go riding down the river on a cold stormy night? Or riding down the river in the warm sunlight? Or riding down the river with my worries and fears? Or riding down the river love in my tears or oh, riding down the river to the dark abyss riding down this river full of shit and piss or oh, riding down the river the river of bliss riding down the river one last kiss oh lord can you hear me Oh Lord, can you hear me? Don't take me down the river tonight. Don't take me down the river too soon. Don't take me down the river for a long, long time. Don't take me down the river for a long, long time. Don't take me down the river tonight. Thank you, Steve Sander. That was wonderful and, and kind of tastefully done, too, I must say. <laughs> Talking about mortality. Mm. Hey, we've got one of the greats here. Charles, come forward and read to us poetry. I uh, first learned how to read at Cafe Lima in the 90s. I started out going like this. Well, <laughs> and then I became uh, a little bit better. So I'm going to read from my chapbook, uh, which was uh, Into the Owl Dream Night. It was published in 2011. Um, 
<clears throat> Here's one from my working in it. I worked several jobs, uh, kind of odd jobs at times, sometimes very odd. Uh, and this was one of the factory jobs I worked. Uh, and it's titled Autumn on the Loading Dock. The night sky rolls its stream, its dream of white shells from ridge to ridge. Lamp, lamp posts pour orange light over factory lot cars. Arms bare, biceps to work gloves. We unload a boxcar, then load a truck. Machine parts haul sea to oil sea. Night shift stretching past dawn, our longest break taken at first light. A, wo woman po <coughs> a woman co worker passes photos of her baby of her baby around as rail spurs, rail spurs ribbon, silvery light. Match flare to cigarette ember, I stand long on dark lip, listening to the bird songs rising from the hills. My eyes shift from lukewarm on the my eyes shift from lukewarm on the downslope of ten hours straight overtime at the boss's command. Friday, Friday one long drag, a boulder uphill, fatigue siphons light from spirit, strength from muscle. I stand long, long before turning, crew boss glaring. His glare is pecking at my shoulders. Train wheel on the horizon. Another truck backing in. Crude joke, sparking laughter. So uh, I've also got a, a series of poems about bus driving. I drove trying that bus for 10 years and was uh, <coughs> injured on that and I wish I got behind a bus ride. But I have uh, oh, maybe 25, 30 poems about it at this point. Uh, some are, uh, I love that job. I just love it. So many anyway, but it had its rough moments and it had its really tragic moments. So this poem was titled after the Richard Gere film. Julia Roberts film, I meant to say, uh, Pretty Woman, uh, and this is a real uh, common experience with bus drivers in Portland. So, Pretty Woman. She offers a quick elixir with her cameo act, maybe 18. She smiles at all the alone drivers while swaying in tight jeans and tank top and running shoes. She pretends to be waiting, waiting for the next bus as I nose this one in. She hopes the staccato dialects of rush hour open a selection of wallets for medicating with timed sex. She poses her tan and supple arms, tropical bomb for a stoplighted fantasies. For fantasy, stoplighted fantasies released from cubicles so ready so ready to become embers flung before sunset. Poachers circle the block, circle the block, vying to drink from her well-marketed mirage, pumping, pumping a syringe full of painkiller smack between her clothes. I'm also, I, where I'm living now, I have a backyard, gazebo, and at least 20, 25 red, mature red cedars, uh, semi-circle. It's open to, to the east. Um, and uh, I, I'm getting my painting back for doing Tai Chi. My ability to use my hands, I have been for, it's been a goal for the past two years. Um, and uh, I have a mixed situation that needs to be cured too. But, um, and so uh, this is from that. I have a, the series is called Oregon Easel, Oregon Canvas. <clears throat> this one is porch e uh, gazebo e easel 
and flight. Sparrows forge thin grasses close to a roadside cross. Train whales curving to amber waves at sunset. His long sable brush carries a dark blue bead from dream. The dark blue flags of dusk unfurl a retrieve a reprieve. He paints a last lamppost, city centurion, close to a meadow, a meadow squared by new sidewalk. The sniper in his tower still squeezing off ricochets, ricochets of bold thoughts, planting crosshairs on crow's feet, deepened, deepened by years of struggle, days of joy. Hope is real as wing shaping wind. Gust change the light while insights ignite the borders of the borders of rust and repair. He dry brushes crows on an oak branch. His, his riverbank gypsy leans into the voice of one current. The dust in his eyes a day closer to its roots. for Charles. Yeah. <laughs> Listening to the bird song in the hills. What a great line. Thank you, Charles. Um, Jack Cooper is going to be our next reader. Where's Jack Cooper? There he is. Come on up. Yeah, it's perfect. Thanks. Hi. Some people. There are some people you know you're going to like even before you meet, meet them. Men who cover their yawns. Women who wear backpacks. Little girls with mud on their faces. Little boys who read. Anyone who picks daisies or pets stray cats. A glassman with the purple dinosaur glued to the tailgate of his truck. The gardener with an old more trees, less bushes bumper sticker. The waitress cleaning up maple syrup all over the high chair who smiles like it was her fault and says, someday I want to have kids. I need one more short one. This is from my book, Across My Silence. Morning of Nothing. I leafed through the paper and found no news today at all. The headlines should have read, relax, nothing happened. I paced the floor thinking that a new idea or an old memory would rear its radiant head. Nada. A complete blank. Something is like nothing in disguise. It's nothing with clothes on. It's nothing until it becomes something. A pencil is something that makes nothing something. An eraser is something that makes something nothing. A pencil can make you remember, but an eraser cannot make you forget. Thank you. Wow, a pencil can make you remember. Good one, I like that. I would like to remind all of you that if it wasn't a single grand poem, it wouldn't be called a universe. Just keep that in mind. It's true. Um, next we will have Donna McNeil will read for us. Donna, come forward, please. Good to be here today, and I, I enjoy so much this opportunity. Um, I don't read aloud often, and so uh, it's nice to be able to come here and do it once in a while. Bound. <clears throat> the words tumble out. Reason seldom surfaces amid the tangle of fears, 
Truth is a stranger, may be an enemy to be kept at bay. My mind internalizes this verbal landslide, a painful image, tortured man, body writhing, bound in a mess of wires, twisting round and round. Reality invisible in his arguments, a dark forest of words. My heart feels torn, tipping between fear and sadness. Anxiety about his stability, aching to somehow ease his suffering. Um, this is an acrostic, um, what divides us, so maybe you can see it in your head a little bit. What will it take for us to see how small the difference between you and me, attentive most to what our outside show that deflect attempts to get to know deep down our simil similarity, implicit through all humanity, vaunting individualism over equality, ignoring calls to community, divided by fear we abandon lucidity, ensnared by imagined threats to liberty, succumb to delusions of superiority. Under the skin, under the sky, all hearts beat like yours, like mine, sacred breath each one inspires, each one humanly divine. Ah, yes, yeah, celebrating that which brings us together. Yeah, lucidity, I like that. <laughs> All righty, whatever that means. Um, no, it's clearness, yes. Um, we have a lady named Sandy Cher who will read for us next. Here she is. Big hand for Sandy Cher. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Short. I drank my milk. I don't know what happened. Anyway. Uh, this one's called Silence. Only now has silence become an unwelcome intruder shuffling through the shadows of my old age loneliness. I throw open windows so the outdoor city sounds can fill these empty corners where children once giggled in their dreams. And I really love silence, which you know, I write this depressing stuff, I don't get it, I'm like the biggest optimist on the planet. But then I come in here and bring everybody down, you know. I was going to be a stand-up comedian or a poet, and I, I don't know, they're just like... Um, this one's called Labyrinth. I'm sorry guys, this is a downer too, but... Uh, in a desert garden in back of the corner church, a labyrinth of small stone, stones forms a mighty circle. My sister marches eagerly in, maybe hoping to find the life she had only a day. Boy, this, this is a whole year ago. I'm sorry, I'll do this again. I thought I was good. Labyrinth. In a desert garden in back of the corner church, a labyrinth of small stones forms a mighty circle. My sister marches eagerly in, maybe hoping to find the life she had only a day ago, or some refuge from her grieving. There is no comfort when she reaches the center and faces the cross. The sun still sets behind the sleeping camel that is a mountain. The moon rises above a cactus that has stood its ground for centuries. It appears the same, but everything has changed. She retraces her steps from the center out, like ripples in a pond, a hapless attempt to cheat time, Gretel without Hansel, seeking escape from the woods and safety and safely home again. These rocks her breadcrumbs. No matter where she steps, her widowhood overtakes her, leaves her forever in this new maze of sorrow. Thank you, Sandy. You uplift us. You do, yeah. There's, there's a lot of heart there. Um, wow. So, so many wonderful poets today. Uh, we will have listening now to the words of Joanne James.
Come on forward, Joanne. Here we go. I would just read two lines. I had this book since the 60s. And I saw it on the shelf here. Okay. What is it I get? <laughs> That's not family friendly. <laughs> I mean, I try. <laughs> I we'll come back here. Okay, come back later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think I came into Howl. War is abstract. The world will be destroyed, but I will die only for poetry that will save the world. <laughs> this, is, this is my poem, Snow. Birthplace, Auburn, a small, dark city. Hematite sky I swallowed at birth instead of mother's milk. Home of the Underground Railroad State Penitentiary. History of family buried in snow. Owasco Lake, black snake in the, mo in the water night, bell tolling midnight. I sleep my ancestors' dream. My parents as children were cold. Snow fell through the roof, drifting onto their beds. Lentils for supper, no treats. Goldfish, flushed down toilet, dolls left behind, evicted again. My grandfather with an axe, chased his wife through the kitchen. This is what we carried with us. Fear of the axe, the mirror broken, the window breaking, emergency room, scarred face. Legacy of civil war, of turning against oneself or the family, because it all comes down to fear and inheritance of madness. The bar room, whorehouse, the passing trains, snow drifting down on the city, graves covered with snow, the snow drifting down on the city in silence. Thank you. Wow, an inheritance of madness. I think we all have that. <laughs> Dreams of the ancestors. Um, Good stuff there. Thank you, Joanne. Next, and I'm always interested because I don't know you guys. If I say the name Shirley Mark, who will stand up? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Come on up. There's a song that they play on the radio sometimes that says, I'm all about the bass, the bass. Well, I'm all about the haiku, the haiku today. So. All right. Okay. These are, um, I would say, these are all, except one, based on personal experience. <laughs> Squirrel on branch. Bird feeder sways gently out of reach. In summer sun, bright orange lilies are tempting bees. <clears throat> Red carnations, hummingbirds hover close and sip sustenance. Light and shadows, dappled colors, blues, pinks, pond lilies in spring. Peacock blue, silver, a filigree lantern, the Alhambra calls. By hanging the shirt and myriad messes clean, spring begins. Yes, yeah, that how nature brings us life, that, that's the highest of haikus. Thank you very much, Shirley. And now I think I know who Janelle Henderson is. There we go. Please come on up, Janelle. Okay. This is called 
wandering love, aching heart. My widow is the sea, and she, bubbling and free, took my heart, blew it to the winds, in order for her to feel it all the time. I did not know how to feel about this. I could sometimes feel lost, going over the mountains to get to her before her vast expanse caught up with my centerpieces again. For she could always feel me, but some parts of my heart, you see, they could never feel her. The wind belongs further and everywhere where it roams, and the oceans have their boundaries. I do not know if she was trying to teach me to miss her and love her more, but it can sometimes get cruel when most of me cannot touch her. I want to play atop her waves, nestle my brown neath her foam in that roaring calm. But I can still feel my fingers sliding down canyons, resting a cheek alongside the smaller streams of the wilderness, not even soaking up her full, real self. Does she feel spread out? Does she feel spread out and stretched thin too? Even so, she would never feel separate from me like I feel separate from her. Was it selfish of her to do that to me? Was it reckless or desperate? Was it wrong? I don't know. She only did something within her own power, and she did it for love. That can surely cannot be faulted though it is a painful burden to bear. And I can never tell her how I feel about this, either. She would only feel guilt, and that would make our love bitter and strained. I can never let her know what she has done to me, but I choose to believe that it is worth it, even though part of me will never be with her, and her sailing golden blue tendrils will never be filled with all of me. But she does not know that, and I cannot break her heart. Love with awareness seems like a curse. Magnifying glass light burns me under its breath, and I wonder what I did so wrong to deserve this illumination. But I have her. That was all I ever wanted. Wow. It's called Dressing. The diner was full of mirrors, prompting me to think of a fun house and nightmares. I realized they were just the eating utensils, and I was looking down. Decided that nightmare was better than looking up. People were the things hiding inside the fun houses, and why I usually stayed away from them. People, you see, they seem to be parallel what you're really looking at, but they're warped when you finally uncover it. it can be, and it can be an endless addicting thing to try and find yourself. Just shouldn't look for it in someone else. Not when you're just doing it for fun anyway. They aren't. They're as serious as the bill after everything on the menu looked good. People are not an exact reflection, and there is no such thing. I'll have my coffee to go, please. Put something extra in it when I get home. When I'm looking for something, it's either everywhere and it's lying to me, or it's nowhere to be found. And when I'm trying hard not to look, I end up getting everything on the side, and I didn't order it. Don't know which is worse. Why would I want to do all that in public? I'm too old for that stuff these days. The whole thing costs too much. What you get out of it don't last. <laughs> one more little one. It's called Glass. The train doesn't want to talk. It wants to sing. I can hear it coming through the wind like a triumphant fall, but not ours. We walk slowly home, battle-weary but victorious, beat but joyful, and we listen for it as, it, as, voice hit, as its voice hits a perfect key. Sometimes so mournful, but not tonight. The whistle, the whistle reaches us, full and bright, picks up the beat when there is nothing left to say. When words are gone, there is music, the sound of a cold silence shattered, and the tears of relief that I waited for. Thank you, Janelle, and that oceanic heart that you speak of. Okay, we're down to our last two. I know that time is our enemy, but hey, what else do we have? Next is Brian Salisbury. Where is Brian Salisbury? There he is. Come on up, Brian. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. I have one four liner and two actual poems. Okay, uh, so. You, you hang in the air like a lover's words that were never there, left unsaid, cloud breath frozen, blown glass sneeze. Maybe the bodies of immortals are rentals, sensual devil, biggest bully in town is king, granddad titan from the next town. Last year's fad god is now a demon, dad's now a god, so we can be kings, pan in the flash, nuclear ash. 
Okay, and then uh, entanglement. Uh, we are all waves till treated as particles. We flow around categories, sometimes fit in yin and yang at once. Relativity is, everything is, a matter of perspective. If you bring up relationship, you have lost perspective. When one's love transforms to analysis, measurement ma makes the other's love paralysis. The uncertainty principle is that if you feel uncertain enough to measure us, the act of measuring where we are changes our momentum, what we are, so you don't get what you saw. Procrustean bed, all is entanglement. <laughs> okay. Well, I could read the... I have a uh, booklet eventually coming out uh, with one four-liner cloned from Ogden Nash poem uh, from the turtle format. Um, I guess I could call them a loku instead of haiku. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll read this one. It's, it's relatively family friendly. <laughs> anteater. The anteater has a, a long snout. His picnic starts when ants come out. A cheap date, but here's the bliss. A foot-long tongue and a French kiss. <laughs> Yes, we are all just particles writing low coup. Thank you very much, Brian. That was delightful. And there's somebody else named Salisbury out there. Joyce Salisbury is going to read for us. Any relation? Quite possibly so. Come on up, Joyce. taught to string the teasing time. The twist, arch, and spasm coil around cold steel. And I know the pitch of bright egg glow, a jeweled pin worn on the tongue. In the caught lunge, the final flop on rock, scraping my rainbow self in the boot burn of air. No longer any need to fish. I let the quick cold wash my resting feet outside the spinning time. And this, um, I used to teach English out at LCC, so I think I had the uh, one of the female one, one of my students once. Anyway, this is called Johnny's Echo. Johnny, you could call geese in from anywhere to loop down from the sky in answer to the lure of safety, or as wise as an Iroquois, throw the doe's moan well enough to bring a buck to your hidden ambush. And woods-wise, you went to that jungle war where vines looped down in blood and the hunted gave a strange call. You were haunted by booby traps and bombs, the terror of being prey. Your poems spoke of running in a strange and beautiful wood and of your rage. Dead now, shot by your wife as you broke down her door, killed by your most elusive prey, in terror of the fury of your rage. That doe you most loved and hated learns a new moan, while in another room your small son practices his call. <laughs> Wow, Joyce. 
That was great. Another hand for Joyce, please. Yes. So we're at the end of our list, and I have a guy named C. Stephen Blue who's going to read to us a little bit, and then we will have a little another poem from our two guest poets. So please, C. Stephen Blue, come on up. Hi everybody. Thanks again, you know, for coming out and uh, this. What a wonderful reading today. Um, so we are definitely running long today. Um, I'm really interested in bringing our two featured readers back up. So I was going to do two pieces. I don't know. Maybe I'll just do one. Uh, I wanted to do a musical piece to kind of <laughs> go with the marriage and with the musical thing we had today. But I'm more interested in doing this piece because I have a new book out. Um, it's called The Power of a Woman. And it's a man's loving perspective of womankind. It's a very personal book. Uh, this is my daughter on the cover. Uh, there's two poems in here about her and three about my mom. And I'm going to do one of the ones about my mom today. Uh, Tara, my daughter, was born on December 17th. So, <laughs> very interesting as far as today goes. So, this one is titled, In the Absence of You. Mom used to tell me I was the one who always brought home the stray dogs. Not my brother, not my sister, but me. Frightened were, were they drawn to me or I to them. Their rescue protected my serenity. I continue to rescue, but now people, it seems, often to the detriment of my well-being. What part of the inner me do I attempt to liberate each time? Is my psyche so shackled? Will a stray restore my freedom or add to my angst? Maybe I'm trying to piece back together that which I have lost. If I can fix you, then maybe you will fix me. But it never works, and the cost is my serenity. Perhaps I need to accept that compassion and empathy are only pieces of life's puzzle and do not always bring serenity in the complex maze of the universe. It's hard to tell what now I do to try to get through in the absence of you. In those final years of Alzheimer's, when I was able to care for you, I recalled how you always rescued me. I was able to be there for you, maybe not to rescue, but to just see you, be with you. And even almost to the end, when I would play for you the music you loved, your music, the music you grew up with, it would always reach you. I could see it in your eyes, and you would smile, and we would dance. There was still that recognizable spark. And I continued to rescue. But now it is me, it seems, to the eternal harmony of my well-being. It's easier to tell what now I do as the blossoming tear breaks through in the absence of you. Thank you, Mom, for letting me bring home the stray dogs. So, thank you. Uh, so I think I will pass on the musical number. You guys will have to wait till uh, I'm going to actually be finally be a featured reader here in October. So come back and see me do some of my performance poetry then. And I would like to bring our two featured readers back up because I'm very anxious to hear both of them again. Who wants to go first? Okay, Leanne. Thank you. It's been great to be here. Every place I go read, I want to move there. <laughs> well, Portland's getting gross, but um, it's great to hear the poetry. It's just poets everywhere are just so much the same. It's just great in a in a good way. Um, hold on, where is it? Shame, shame, shame. Um. This is the image that goes with it, the white tennis shoe, if you can see it. And for all the problems and et cetera that I had with my mother, one thing I will say about her, she was the most curious, go for it, positive, I want to be busy, do stuff person. 
the opposite of me, who could sit and do nothing, or ride a bike, and that's whatever. So this is kind of about that. Sheen, at 90, she leapt into a Venetian flat boat as if one of the flying Walendas, right off the street, over the wobbling canal. But she had to. She had to make that leap. We had to catch the boat. She aced it. Not a hitch in her AAA kids. They were yellowed like teeth after so many washings. How she'd worried for months. Hey, you got this, we said. Piece of cake. Then she nailed it. Boom, cruising on the ripples to the airport, her face shone. You know, she said, most of my friends, they can't even walk. She was staring at the moon. We were staring at the moon and at her face. Her face shone, yes, brilliant against the sky, yes, her sheen outshone the moons and the Adriatics, sheen for sheen, my mother's face. Where do we get all this poetry? <laughs> yeah, where do we get it all? Sometimes look in the acknowledgments. Mine says, and, as always, hail to Queen Jane, who is not only the tolerant subject of some of these poems, but also an uncredited source for many of the best lines. <laughs> Jane sings in the kitchen. A John Cage arrangement of California, here I come. Pagan tongue spread among the literate genitals of mummies, rattle museums, seen through the window, dogs to find perimeters, suburban garden hoses lurk in the lawns, average number of peas in a pod is decreasing, cholera has broken out down the street. Border guard takes one look at us and wants to know what's in the trunk open like an amplifier full blast or a sardine tin split with corpses laughing coffee and cigarettes from the living room i hear a voice that sings clearly amused by television commercials but not sold a long distance runner crossing time zones miles without refrain <laughs> Wow, thank you, people. You are all so awesome. What a great day. What a great reading. What a great event today. I, I want to thank you all for coming out again. And uh, our featured readers, Casey Bush and Leanne Grabel, uh, let's give them another hand. Uh, and again, if you'd like to support them, uh, they have some books available. You can see them after. And if you can't buy one today, Please pick up one of our flyers off the table there and go to our website. You can find links to all their work there as well. And uh, videos, you will all be on the, my YouTube video. You will find the link to that there also. And uh, that, that comes up in about a couple weeks after the event. So look for that in a couple weeks. Uh, again, thanks for, thank you all for coming out. And we have next month, we have A. Lynn Ash and Gaston. So... Their uh, information about them is on the back of the flyer. So check that out. We hope you'll join us again next month. Thank you all so much. <laughs>